So, John Steele, the man in the small box at the <laughs> top of your screen. Um, we think he might at some point become bigger, but then he might not because he's, we've got to see his images. And um, in that, you know, John has to uh, pay the price for his art and be small. Um, John was saying to me um, as we were chatting, because the sound actually is really, really good, um, that today is the 30th anniversary of his entry into um, the BNP building in Pennington, uh, and thus his entry into um, advertising. Which is um, a, I, I was saying, a sort of matter for enormous congratulations. Anyone who's five, thirty years in this business is uh, doing very well. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but it is also, it also struck me, um, as he said that, that John is a fantastic example of the rule of threes, because um, communications polymath as he is, there are all, he's also threes abound um, in his life because he has really only worked for three people. He's worked for BMP, or DDB is there now. Um, could be Berlin Silverstein, great uh, West Coast um, agency, um, and WPP. Um, he's also actually one of the, I think probably the only person who's become famous for being really brilliant at three things. He's a great planner, still is a great planner, He's a great writer, two incredibly highly regarded books in Truth, Lies and Advertising and Perfect Pitch, and a great new business guru, which of course brings us to tonight. And the third rule of threes, because in these things they're always three, um, <laughs> he's actually done it, again, almost uniquely, on three continents, worked in Europe, worked in America, and now in Australia. But to complicate things, he's in New York. <laughs> what he's now going to talk to us about is, is how you stitch together that seamless piece of alchemic magic that on the day makes the client go, oh, I want to work with these people. And that, of course, is what next week is all about. So, John, with enormous pleasure, I hand the floor over to you. Thank you very much. So, Hello everybody, apologies for the changes of location and changes of time. I was supposed to be making this presentation from Western Australia, but about a week ago I discovered that I had to make a trip to New York. So here I am, but uh, thank you all for your flexibility in, in changing arrangements. Um, now I'm going to talk about three things broadly. Um, the first part of my presentation it will probably be of no help to you whatsoever for next week, but it's made on the assumption that at some point in your careers, you know, many of you, most of you, maybe all of you will end up in management positions in agencies and end up in positions where you're making decisions about new business and about agency strategy. And I have some thoughts about the way agencies philosophically have to approach new business that I'll talk about briefly by way of introduction. Uh, I also look at a general approach to new business pitches before getting into the nitty gritty of the stuff that you're probably going to be most interested in, which is how do you make an effective presentation that causes the client to say, absolutely, yeah, I want to work with those people. Um, generally, the first rule of which is, is don't make your presentation via video conference from another <laughs> continent when you have jet lag. Um, I've, um, I've just spent the last two days flying to New York. Um, I'm going to be in New York for about 36 hours before I fly back to Western Australia. My brain is somewhere over the Pacific right now, and I'm not entirely sure what's going to come out of my mouth when I make this presentation. So apologies in advance if, if I appear at times like a poorly dubbed movie, um, and the lips are moving, but nothing's quite connecting with either my brain or yours. So, with that having been said, you are all familiar with and had a presentation a few weeks ago, I believe, from Jeremy Bullmore. Um, Jeremy Bullmore being one of the great, great pleasures for me in working at WPP for years. I was lucky enough to have his office about 20 meters away from my own. So whenever I had anything complicated to deal with, I could go talk to Jeremy and ask him what he thought, which was usually brilliant and usually helped me solve whatever it was I couldn't fix. Well, there's a, a story Dave Trott 
tells about Jeremy um, from the 1970s. Jeremy was asked to be the master of ceremonies at a big charity event in one of the London, uh, London hotels on Park Lane. And the brief for the evening was for Jeremy to welcome everybody and ask them to part with some cash and give it as a sort of like a, a donation on the night. So everybody arrived, a thousand people in the ballroom all wearing their tuxedos and ball gowns. And Jeremy said hello and thanked everybody for coming and asked them to reach into their pockets and pull out a ten pound note and lay it on the table in front of them and have that be a donation for the evening. And people started rummaging around in their pockets and under their tables and in their handbags and, and Jeremy stopped, stopped. He said, I, 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 sorry, but I do hear a rumble of discontent around the room. And he said, I can, ima I can imagine why some of you are grumbling, because after all, you know, you've all been great supporters of this charity. You've all paid a lot of money to be here tonight, paid a lot of money for your tables and getting their hair done and renting the tuxedos. And the last thing I would want to do is ask for money from somebody who couldn't afford it. <laughs> and he paused for a moment and looked around the room and said, maybe there's a test for this. Could you please raise your hand if you know to within the nearest 10 pounds the balance of your bank account? And he looked around and not an arm was raised and they went on to happily donate their 10 pounds each and the charity raised more money at that event than it ever had in any previous event. And I've always thought it was an interesting approach because the natural approach for anybody in that position being asked to raise money on the night would be to show the film of the, the starving children, the failing crops, the abused animals or whatever the charity was and ask for a donation based on people's relationship with the charity. And that's not what Jeremy did. Instead, he asked for a donation based on their relationship with wealth, their relationship with money. And in so doing, changed the rules and created a level of involvement that I don't think he would have got using the, the obvious approach. And, and I asked Jeremy a, a, a while ago, if he could, and I was talking to him about advertising and asked him for a definition of advertising at its best. And he said, and I hope you can see this on your screen, that he's always thought of it as the invention of a stimulus that creates a predetermined reaction among a complicit audience. And I think that's a pretty good definition for a good presentation too, a, a good definition for an effective presentation. And Coco Chanel was once asked about how she defines success in her craft. And she said, well, success to me uh, she said, I know if somebody walks into a room wearing one of my dresses and people say, what a beautiful dress, that I've failed. I feel I've succeeded if that same person walks into a room wearing one of my dresses and people say, you look beautiful. The dress is a means to an end, just as good advertising is a means to, is a means to an end and good presentation is a means to an end. And that predetermined reaction um, how do we fashion a stimulus in our presentations that create that predetermined reaction? And how can we fashion the presentation in a way that makes our audience complicit? That's going to be the theme that runs through pretty much everything I have to say today. And what I'm going to say up front about an approach to new business is based on a simple premise that it's better for an agency to win more often than it loses. And I think in, in the agency world in general, you know, a 25, 30% success rate in new business is regarded as pretty decent. Um, I worked at an agency in San Francisco that for 10 years won 90% of the new business that it pitched. And it grew from a $30 million agency to a billion dollar agency, 30 people to 500 people. Um, and then it went from a billion dollar agency to a two billion dollar agency and a three billion dollar agency and a thousand people. And people often used to say, you guys must be just great at new business. You must be amazing at pitching. And so, yeah, I think we were pretty good at it. Um, but the one thing that defined our success in new business, and I, and I think the thing that defines the success of most agencies who are good at new business, has to do um, with this word. And the word is no. And, and in the 10 years that I worked at Goodby Silverstein and Partners, 
we said no to four out of five opportunities to pitch. So I remember at the time, a lot of it was at the time of the dot com boom, and these venture capitalists, these, these guys from uh, Stanford MBAs would come in with wheelbarrows of cash that they got from venture capitalists and they'd pitch their idea to us, their company to us, and we'd say, well, what's the idea? And they'd say, well, the idea is to get rich quick. Um, the idea is for us to build this company, go public, and then retire in five years. We said, no, no, what, not, we're not asking what your personal retirement plan is. We're asking you what the idea of the company is. Why should somebody be interested in, in your brand? Um, and, and generally, the answers they gave us were inadequate. And in four out of five of those cases, we'd say no to pitching. We, we, we pitched two dot-com businesses in those years. One was a fledgling company called eBay. And the other one was a tiny company nobody had heard of called E-Trade. Both of which we thought were based on very, very good ideas and were run by very passionate people. Now, now to me, um, you've got to ask yourself four or five questions when faced with an opportunity to pitch. Obviously, in your situation with the presentation you have to make in a week's time, you had no choice. You're part of this program, you've got to make your pitch in a week, you can't turn down the business um, on any basis at all. But the first question you have to ask yourselves as an agency, when, when the client first get in touch, is to say, do we want the business? Do we think this business has a real place in the world? Do we like the product? Do we like the people? And, and if the answer is no on any of those bases, you, you, you have to turn it down. Um, can we be ourselves in pitching this business? I've seen many agencies make new business pitches where they're pretending to be something else. They're a big agency who are pretending to be small and cool because that's what they think the client's really looking for. There are small agencies that don't have many people that, that hire actors to come and sit in their empty offices to make it look like they're a big and vibrant company. And I always think of it, it's the same advice I give to people when they apply for jobs. It's like, don't pretend to be somebody else in order to get the job, because if you get the job but pretending to be somebody else, you have to go on pretending for a very long time. And if you get the job, and that's kind of uncomfortable for everyone. So can, you know, do we want the business? Can we be ourselves? Can we win? You've got to be realistic about that. Um, a lot of agencies persuade themselves that under certain favorable circumstances, they might be able to win that they want to win. Yeah, of course you want to win, but can you? In reality, can you win? I did a pitch with JWT in London a few years ago when the agency was asked to re-pitch the Persil and Omo business, and that, a pitch that was subsequently won by BBH. And having been asked to participate in this pitch, I spent a couple of weeks getting to know what was going on and, and went to people at JWT and I said, I don't think you have a chance of winning this pitch. I think they've made their decision already. And they said, well, no, it's our oldest client, 60 years, we've got to re-pitch, um, you know, we still think we can win this. And winding forward six months later, and we'd made our final presentation, and as the clients were filing out, a couple of them said to me as I shook their hands, you've made things very difficult for us. And what they meant by that was you guys have made a presentation that we didn't think you were going to make. Um, you made a, you've presented very good work to us, it's very good presentation, we didn't think that was going to happen and we'd already decided to give the business to somebody else, but now you've made it difficult to justify that decision. And when the decision was finally made and ratified, another of the clients told us that wasn't an exam, it was continual assessment and for the last two years the business was being lost. And I, I think agencies have to be smarter about that sort of thing and recognise when something has slipped away and say, you know what, you know, we've, we're really proud of the work we've done, the length of the relationship, but you obviously want to work with a new agency and please go with our blessing and best wishes. And um, the word no, actually in other contexts can work pretty well. Again, I say this to you as potential managers of agencies one day. In the years that I worked at Gooby Silverstein, we had a policy, whenever a new marketing director or chief executive was hired at our client company, the first thing we would do, hope, generally within the first week that they were in the job, was go to see them and resign the business. And we would say, look, it's our observation that generally when a new person arrives in your position, the first thing they do is fire the agency, 
Um, we'd really like to make that easy for you, and we'd like to make that as painless as possible. We will offer our resignation. And of course, because we did it in the first week, that was generally the last thing they wanted to happen. And not once in all the years we did it, did anybody actually accept our resignation. Um, and we prevented ourselves getting fired weeks or months down the line, time and time again, by saying no to the client in the course of our very first conversation. Uh, it's an interesting psychology. Um, the last question I wanted to touch on before I get into the nitty gritty of pitch preparation is, again, a question the agency has to ask itself when presented with an opportunity. Um, is the A-team available? And do we have time to do our best work? Those two questions are inextricably linked. I don't think any agency should be pitching new business if in doing so they jeopardize commitments that they've made to existing clients. When things are busy with existing business, you just can't go pitching new stuff because you'll end up probably losing the pitch because you don't have time to devote to it properly and you will probably destabilize an existing client relationship too. Um, I always think too that there has to be a core of people on any pitch that's the same. There has to be a team in every agency for pitching. Now, regardless of what a client says about wanting to meet the people who are going to work on the business day to day, in my years at Goodby, there were seven partners in the agency. There were three creative partners, three client service partners, and then myself as the sole planning partner. On every pitch, we'd have one of the creative partners, one of the client service partners, and me. And we would continue to work on the business, you know, taking overall responsibility for the client service side of things, or the creative side, or the planning side, once the agency won it. Um, we would have a small team of people work with us on the pitch, but there would always be a core team of partners on every pitch. A core team who were used to working with each other, could finish each other's sentences, who liked and respected each other, and, and just knew how the whole new business machine worked. And it, I think it's very important in every agency to have a group of people like that. Now, if the answer to those questions is yes, and if you decide that you are going to go ahead and make the pitch, then I've got 10 things to say that, that I think are important as you approach it. And these, again, are very general things that are of less relevance to the topic that you're working on. But first of all, I think small teams win pitches. I never like to have more than four or five people in the core team that's responsible for a new business pitch. Any more than that, and you've got too many opinions, and it's very hard to resolve the more difficult issues. And of those four or five people, you've got to have somebody who's clearly a leader, and who, who ultimately, if people can't agree on something, says, okay, this is the way that, that we're going to go. One of the things that has been a real problem I've seen in agencies who lose in new business is that very often, the people who make the final pitch and make the final decisions aren't involved in that core team that's developing the pitch. And I worked at an agency in New York for a, about a year, and in that particular agency, though, it was founded by two creative partners um, who were very good at saying to people, OK, you take responsibility for this pitch. We've got full confidence in you. You go ahead and do it. And they pick four or five people and say it was all up to them. The night before the pitch, they would come in and say, okay, just, just, for, you know, just to make sure, show us what you've got. And the team would show them what they've got. And then the partners would go, that's shit. You can't possibly show that tomorrow. You're letting the agency down. You're letting all of us down. It's a disaster. And my job as new business director in that agency was largely to keep the founding partners either away from new business altogether or have them involved completely right from the start and throughout the process. And you've got to have that decision-making involved as, as part of your team. Um, I think that first impressions are vital in new business. As, as a new business director, I've always wanted to win the pitch at the credentials or capability stage, or at least make it very, very difficult for other agencies to catch us up. And generally, the best way I've found of doing that is by finding a way in the capabilities meeting for the client to spend most of the time talking about themselves 
and for us to actually do very little of the talking and the presenting. You know, I'll generally say, here's our best guess at the main issues that we think are keeping you awake at night. Which of them would you like us, which, which would you like to talk about? And which of them would you like us to talk about from the point of view of experience we have in solving similar problems? And that generally provides the kind of conversation that has the client talk for 90% of the time, at the end of which they say that was a great conversation and they want to work with us. Um, you've got to act like the incumbent in a pitch. And my, my view is that when you're briefed by a client, that's the point where you say, okay, we've got the business now. And for the duration of this pitch, be it three weeks or three months, we will act like we're their agency. And at the end, if they choose to hire somebody else, it has to feel to them like they have to fire us. And again, psychologically, it's a subtle difference, but it's a very important one. And it requires the agency to be completely honest, completely open. Um, in the years I worked at Goodby, we very often used to invite clients when we were testing work in the process of preparing a pitch, we'd ask clients to come along and see the work being tested and see the reaction to it and see how we reacted to the reactions. On occasion, we'd have the client come in and sit with one of our creative directors when they were seeing work from their teams for the first time. Now, that's something that would make most agencies sort of hair turn white at the very thought of it, but, but it was a terrific thing to do. Um, and it wasn't choreographed, it, it wasn't rehearsed the day before. It was for real. It would be Rich Silverstein sitting in his office and a creative team coming in and showing him work and him telling him it was terrible because it didn't solve the client's marketing problem or him telling them that it was great for reasons that maybe didn't occur to the client, but it, it made them see that the creative director was actually a businessman as well. Um, agencies have to push back in new business. I've always felt that clients smell desperation like dogs smell fear and Agencies too readily just take a client brief at face value and, and spend a lot of time very elegantly sometimes solving the wrong problem. If you think it's the wrong problem, you've got to be able to push back and you've got to debate as you would in a no normal everyday client agency relationship. Um, it's good to involve the entire agency. I don't think there's anything more exciting for an agency than, than pitching a big piece of new business. And I don't like to see agencies keep it separate and have teams working off in separate buildings or separate rooms, almost in, in secret. It, it, it's much better to have everybody know what's going on. And if you can, give everybody a role in that and give them a sense of, of you know, that, that, that their contribution in some small way to what you're doing, even if you give them just a very small task, and it might be to do with, you know, going and researching something in a mall or, um, you know, getting familiar with a particular video game produced by your client, whatever it is, give a lot of people a role and a sense of participation. Uh, one of the good things that the agency in New York did re re relating to new business, and this is going to sound very cheesy, but it, it gave, kind of gave people a, a, sense, a sort of sense of possession of what was going on. As the team left to go and make a pitch, the, um, the receptionist, there was a tradition that the receptionist would hit a button on a, a hi-fi system and the, the Hawaii Five O theme music would boom out across the agency, which is in this big um, warehouse building. And the team would walk out in their art bags as they were headed to the airport. And you kind of walk along a line of people as high-fiving as, as you went along. But the next morning, people would know what time you were going into that meeting room in Colorado to make your pitch. And it just gave everybody a sense of excitement and anticipation. Um, getting more relevant, I suppose, to what you're doing next Monday, I, I don't think you should ever present more than one idea in a pitch. Um, if clients ask for more, then... I sometimes do show more, but I only show more by showing the idea that maybe we started with and figured out was wrong, and then another, another idea that we figured out was wrong, but the combination of the learning from those two ideas led us to this one idea that we now believe is right. Um, sometimes I do that whether it was entirely true or not because I wanted to set up ideas that I thought other agencies were going to present. and trying to persuade the client how crap those ideas were before the, the other agencies actually got to present them. But one idea and agree it early. 
and it's probably now already too late for this particular piece of advice, but however long I have to prepare a new business pitch, whether it's three days, three weeks, three months, I divide the time available into three equal parts. A third of the way through that process, I want to have everybody agreed on an idea. And I then spend the next third of the time blowing that idea out in every possible direction, and the final third of the time figuring out how best to present it. That final third is time that agencies rarely spend, but the best ideas in the world will not do well in a pitch if they're presented badly, and you've got to spend time figuring that out. Um, sometimes agencies can win pitches by coming up with a brilliant idea at the last minute. Generally, that doesn't work. I mean, I'd say 95% of the time or more, it won't work if the idea isn't arrived at until the night before the pitch. And the reason agencies often do that is they, they keep saying to themselves, no, this isn't a perfect idea. Now, my former partner in San Francisco, Rich Silverstein, was once asked by a client having presented a campaign, Rich, is that the best campaign you could possibly have presented to me? And Rich said, I don't know, is your wife the best woman you could possibly have married? Um, you make... I, I, I think a, you know, people will say a third people will say a third way through the process it's too early and and this idea that we're agreeing on isn't perfect it's not the best idea we could possibly come up with well maybe it's not but I believe very strongly that a 70% idea agreed on a third of the way early will become a 90% a 95% idea through the time that you spend with it through the confidence that you develop as you see all of its other possibilities, through the time that you spend discussing it, describing it to other people, the language you come up with, you just become comfortable with that idea, you become confident with that idea, and that confidence becomes um, sort of both, both palpable and infectious. So, so don't seek perfection. Trust your instincts. Very often the first idea that comes into your head is gonna be the right idea. Jeff Goodby, the other creative partner in San Francisco once said to me that he thinks nine times out of ten the first thing that pops into his mind when he hears the client brief is ultimately the idea that he presents but he generally spends a long time trying to persuade himself that maybe that's not the right idea and exploring other options but but you must trust your instincts trust your instincts as people trust your instincts as people who have consumed advertising not just created it um, trust your instincts as humans, as, as, as brothers, as sisters, as shoppers, as, as people who go to football matches, as people who go shopping in Waitrose. You do know stuff about the world and you have basic human instincts about those things that too often we suppress in the, to, under the cause of being professional. Um, being professional doesn't help you solve business problems. Being human does. Ultimately, you've got to want it more. And I think that the reason the client will choose one of your agencies over others next Monday is that they will find your, your confidence in your idea and your enthusiasm for your idea infectious. And that confidence and that enthusiasm and the chemistry between your group, whichever group wins, will be the thing that will carry it probably more than the content you present. Because any client looks at the various groups of people presenting and they ask themselves what it would be like meeting you at 8 o'clock on a Monday morning in January. Um, when getting there is difficult, when it's a cold, miserable day, when they've you know, just had a great weekend and they don't want to be starting working. And which group of people are they most going to want to get in a small room with and solve problems? Um, you need that group to be you. And how do you do that? Um, how do you create the stimulus that creates the predetermined reaction among a complicit audience? Well, the first and most important thing that both good advertising and good presentations have in common is they make connections. And the example I'm about to show you, I, I show at great personal risk. Um, as indeed I took the photograph that you're seeing at the moment at great personal risk. Um, this is a phone box in Barclay Square 
in Mayfair. And I photographed this worrying, worrying the whole time that Sir Martin Sorrell was going to drive by, <laughs> seeing me taking pictures and writing notes as I looked at the advertising in that particular phone box. Because as you know, phone boxes in London these days are not used for making phone calls. And they are instead an advertising medium. And, and I just wanted to show you some of the ads, or at least some parts of the ads, from that particular phone box on that particular day, by way of illustrating this point of making connections. Now, as you know, the ads in phone boxes generally consist of a lurid picture accompanied by a headline and a few copy points. They're basically pieces of advertising. On this one day, we saw ads that said things like, and I will spare you the lurid pictures, um, home visits available, fantasies fulfilled, open late, exotic massage, sexy slim beauty, 21 years old, hotel visits, no rush, um, busty Brigitte, toys, video, shower, drinks, hotel visits. When, when I first took these examples back and tried to create a PowerPoint presentation out of them, I, I asked my assistant, and, and could probably be jailed these days for doing so, but I asked her to turn these cards into slides. And I'd just written down the, the pertinent features because I di actually didn't want to be seen by anybody taking cards out of the phone box. I thought that would be even worse than taking <laughs> pictures. Um, and this one came back to me and the slide said, Bushy Brigitte. Because um, my, my handwriting is obviously a little hard to decipher, but I found the idea of Bushy Brigitte strangely alluring. Um, <laughs> anyway, there, there is a, was another ad, it's a bit of a worry, the, the mature continental blonde whose finest feature is her comfortable apartment. Um, but all, all of those ads, they're like bad car ads, we, you know, features, features, features. And there were two ads in the two presentations, if you like, in that phone box that I thought were different. And the first one uh, just had this by way of copy underneath the lurid picture, genuine picture. So immediately I found myself not looking at that one, but looking at all the others and said, oh, so that maybe means those others aren't genuine, right? It, it, it created a reaction in my head, created a connection that was interesting. When I say my head, I, I detach myself. Professionally speaking, um, it, would create, it would create a reaction in the head of the observer. Uh, I found another one in that phone box, which was probably one of the best pieces of advertising I've ever seen. And it created connections in lots of interesting ways that I won't go into on the grounds that it will probably increase. Um, there wasn't even a picture with that one just said, I love my job. And just in case anybody's writing down the phone number, that's WPP's switchboard number in London. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, don't, don't go calling that number and, and giving your name. Um, but, it, it, but it makes a lot of connections between the product and service on offer, the person seeking the service and any, um, any concerns they might have, um, the broader human and cultural context, um, think about it, how many people do you know who say, hand on heart, apart from the people in your room who work for me, how, could, how many people do you know who hand on heart say, I love my job? It, not many. Um, in this particular context, that's particularly surprising. Um, very, very interesting the way it does its communication with just, just four words. The reason it works and the reason a lot of good presentations work is they take the wider view. They're not constrained by the brand or by the category. Um, they look outside. I love my job takes the wider view. It doesn't focus on the matter at hand. Instead, it puts it in the context of work. It promises enthusiasm. Um, good presentations take a similarly broad view, and I'll, I'll show an example later. Um, I love my job's also very simple. I once made a pitch presentation using only one slide. Um, and it was a pitch to Porsche in Germany. And I walked into their boardroom with two slide carousels in my hand. One of them had 60 slides in it, and the other had one slide. And I, I gave them the choice. I said, I could do this one of two ways. But I said, the one slide version, on the one slide is one word. And that one word de defines for us the problem, the real problem that we need to address if we're going to make this company great. 
it also starts to suggest the solution. Uh, that one word was asshole, um, and it, it, it described a reaction of people to those who might buy or drive a Porsche in North America, which was the, where we were pitching the business at the time. And, you know, I set up an elaborate story before I showed that slide, but that was the only slide I showed. And there was a very, very uncomfortable silence at the end of it, as when I screened it, and I, it was a silence. I don't know how long it lasted. It lasted long enough for me to remember all the times my partners had said, don't show that slide. <laughs> and, and, and it also lasted long enough for me to realize that the reason they'd said don't show that slide was that everybody sitting around the table in front of me wearing a dark pinstripe suit was also a Porsche driver. Um, they would have been, given that they were the board members of, of Porsche in Germany. Um, but after that, what seemed like a very, very long and uncomfortable silence, somebody said, well, I was out with my wife last weekend and somebody raced us away from the lights and flipped us off as they went, pa went past. And somebody else talked about having their car keyed. And, and it kind of went around the table and everybody had their own example of being treated badly on the basis solely of driving that vehicle. And they still at Porsche refer to the asshole factor as, as something that needs to be addressed in any piece of communication. Um, but I digress. Um, make connections, take the wider view, keep it simple. Um, it's something that was done very well with this campaign um, from a few years ago and Barack Obama's first election campaign. Hope, change, yes we can. A line incidentally stolen from the Bob the Builder. I'm surprised nobody made the connection at the time. <laughs> But, but what, was, what was great about that campaign, and what also showed, sowed the seeds for discontent with Obama's presidency, was that he was, never, uh, he was never specific about what people might hope for. He was never specific about what was going to be changed. He just created this wonderful feeling that it, a, a, an Obama administration would give people what they were hoping for. An Obama administration would change so many of the things that people didn't like about the previous Bush administration. Um, but obviously the 60 million people who voted for him all had their own versions of what they hoped for, what they wanted to change, and not all of them could be satisfied. But as a sales device and as a presentation device, it, was, it left enough room for people to join the dots up for themselves, and in Jeremy's words, to be a complicit audience. Um, being a complicit audience is about making your message personal. Uh, I once saw an interview with Steven Spielberg where he was asked about his craft and said, I make movies for the masses, but I talk to them one at a time. And I think that's a wonderful definition for what we do at our best. Yes, we target mass audiences, but if we really do our job right, every individual in that target audience has a personal reaction to our message. And when you make your presentations in a week's time, you shouldn't think about an audience as a singular thing. However many people are in it, it's not an audience. Um, it's an audience comprising however many individuals there are in there, and you've got to be able to make a connection to each one of them. And um, when you are making your presentation, you have to remember that what you say is less important than how you say it. And there are various studies done about this, and it, it's yes, it's a cliche, but cliches are cliches because they're true. Um, a lot of people think that 90% of the effectiveness of a presentation is in the way it's delivered, uh, not necessarily in the answer that's presented. And it's why I say the 70% idea agreed early and expressed with enthusiasm, presented with enthusiasm and energy, will very often be something that might actually have a little bit more potential, but that's presented by tired people, by people who've been beaten up because it's only been arrived at at four o'clock in the morning before they pitch. And as Jeremy will have said to you, it's not what you say that's as important as what is received. You know, what is transmitted is not necessarily the same as what's being received. And that's vital. As you look at your presentations in the run-up to next month, you've got to put yourself in the position of the people receiving the presentation. What are their thoughts and prejudices coming into this? What will they be hearing as you're talking? Are there certain words that you will use and take for granted 
that they that will have a different meaning to them. Um, don't forget that the idea that you're presenting is something that you will have lived with for X number of weeks beforehand, but they'll be seeing for the very first time. You can't make assumption the assumption that they've been with you in all of your discussions and have had the same sort of arguments and agreements that, that you've had. So here's a, a very common example of the difference between what's said and what's received. And here's, here's our letter from my bank started not too long ago. Dear valued customers, well, my bank might consider um, that, I, that, that I should think myself most fortunate to be addressed as a valued customer. You know, when in fact being addressed as a valued customer has exactly the opposite effect. You know my name. You, you know my name when you send me a bill for something. How come you don't know my name on this particular occasion? It's, it's ridiculous. Um, you know my name, asshole. Why not use it? Um, here's a, another thing. You see, you, anytime you go into a coffee bar, buy a cup of coffee, there'll be a jar, a cup, some, something, some receptacle up on the top um, in, in which it is hoped that you will deposit your, your change. This is a picture taken close to my home in Western Australia in a coffee bar and a little label that says tips. Well, what else is it going to be? Um, another cafe nearby has this. Uh, it's run by a couple of surfers who close the place down for a few weeks each year and go off on some wonderful trip. Now, I feel different. If I put my coins into this jar, or if I put my coins into this jar, it's a very different experience. And here I'm living somewhat vicariously through their great surfing trip. Um, I've never put as much money in either of those jars um, as I have into this one. Um, this other <laughs> cafe near my house... Um, I'm, I'm extremely generous um, when I approach this, this particular jar, um, but they're all saying the same thing. Um, they're just saying it in different ways that elicit different levels of connection, different levels of involvement. Now, you're not going to be able to read this, so I will read it for you. Um, it's a letter that I received um, a few years ago now, actually, and I've been using quite regularly ever since um, to illustrate a point of our presentation. And if, if anybody in the room is related to anybody from the Blue Spoon Consulting Group, please don't tell them I'm showing this. But it's addressed to Mr. John Steele, consultant WPP Group. Dear John, Blue Spoon specializes in systems marketing. Systems marketing is put in inverted commas. And I know if somebody was presenting it live, they'd do this, as they said it. Whenever anybody does that, I want to punch them, but anyway. Um, Blue, Blue Spoon specializes in systems marketing, a paradigm shift in brand communications planning. The use of the phrase paradigm shift is another reason to punch someone, in my opinion. Anyway, bringing, together, bringing together the tools of systems dynamics, brand communications expertise, and the latest ideas from information management, Systems Marketing is an innovative business development model for an agency network. Developed independently over the past two years and initially focusing on the pharmaceutical industry, Systems Marketing creates a new market for consulting and marketing services, adds incremental revenue to multiple business units simultaneously, responds to considerable industry pain, and would help WPP differentiate its offer and grow its business on all accounts. Wow, get me some Martin on the phone right now. Now, so many things. First of all, I didn't, I didn't understand a word of those first two paragraphs. Usually, I think it, probably when I got to paradigm shift would be the point at which I just sort of tore it up and, and threw it away. But I thought I might be in the presence of greatness, so I stuck with it for a little while. And they actually included a presentation with this unsolicited note. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe their graphic representation of the Blue Spoon solution will make clear everything that was not clear from the first two paragraphs. So they introduced me to a new kind of marketing, fusing thinking from three fields, systems dynamics, information management, brand communications. Um, now, this is, this is one of the best presentation charts, one of my favorite presentation charts of all time. Um, if I had a top 10, this would certainly be in the top 
the top one, probably. Um, and and I, I like it because I've always imagined somebody going to the graphics department and saying, OK, guys, I need a visual that shows connectivity as a competitive advantage. And I look at that, and I think, wow. Just, just, just feel, feel the connectivity. Um, still, still unclear. Field level tactical system, where the system is the tactic. Innovative, coordinated action. Configuration strategy, communication strategy, management strategy. Bullet point, bullet point, bullet point. And if you go to the last bullet point, you'll see the objective is always efficiency. OK, let's see how that works, shall we? Don't worry about what these points say. It will be of no significance whatsoever. Um, nothing and absolutely nothing will become clearer as, as positive feedback loops develop, as they multiply, as they inexplicably migrate from the right-hand side of the slide to the center of the slide. And fin finally, the blue spook solution is shown in all of its glory. <laughs> now, you, you may well laugh at the Blue Spoon Consulting Group's expense, which I have and many audiences have over the years. It, it's rather sobering to realize that approaches like this are used in presentation on somewhat more important issues. Um, this is a slide that was released to, I think, the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times by somebody within the Pentagon. Um, and this slide is meant, to demonst was meant to illustrate US strategy in Afghanistan. Um, all I can say is no wonder things got so messed up in Afghanistan. And, and, and it's ironic, when you look at the bottom right there, you'll see that this is working draft version 3, which I can only imagine is a simplified version from versions 1 and versions 2. Um, I do trust no, present, no slides like this will be shown next Monday. Now, there's an assumption that the more you put into a presentation, the more that people will take out. And the more facts you put in, the more persuasive the presentation will be. And, and it's just not true. And nowhere was this more obvious than in the trial of O.J. Simpson, which, you know, despite the best efforts of Oscar Pistorius, remains the most famous trial in human history. Um, and and, and O.J. was... The, the prosecution in that case had almost every piece of evidence a prosecution would want to get a conviction. And they took the view that in order to convict him, the best approach was to lay out all of that evidence and lay it out in laborious detail, which they did over a 26-week period. And six weeks of those 26 were devoted to DNA evidence, in the course of which two weeks was devoted to explaining how DNA testing is done and what it means, the rest of the four weeks to the, the findings of, of the police and the pieces of evidence. And all of it was added up, and experts in the end said that the chances of the blood spots on OJ not belonging to the victims and the chances combined with the chances of the blood spots near the victims not belonging to OJ were around 11 billion to one. Now I'm not a betting man, but 11 billion to one. Seem, if, you know, if, if I thought that my chance of losing in the lottery was 11 billion to one, I'd probably buy a lottery ticket. Um, OJ walked free. And the reason OJ walked free was that laying out all of those facts did nothing more than bore the jurors, did nothing more than distance the jurors, did nothing more than, than have the jurors feel that they were being talked down to. Conversely, the defense in the OJ case told a story. They told a story um, because they assumed that the, the jurors would believe all the evidence and think that OJ was guilty. So they said, OK, we're not going to try to prove that he's innocent. We are simply going to try to make it difficult for the jurors who believe he's guilty to convict him. A subtle but very, very important difference. And they did that by telling a story not just about the evidence, but how the evidence fitted into the context of Los Angeles and the United States and the context of racism within those areas, 
and particularly within the context of racism inside the Greater Los Angeles Police Department. And in telling that story in a very evocative, poetic way, quite briefly and quite simply, they took six weeks versus the prosecution's 26. Um, they were able to persuade the jurors that there might just might have been a chance of a racist cop planting evidence. And OJ walked free. Now, I, I'm going to disappear from the screen for a minute, and, and I hope that you'll be able to show a piece of film live in the, the room in London. I'm not going to try to transmit it. I want to show you this film. It's a clip from Mad Men, um, and it's a pitch that Don Draper makes to the Kodak Eastman company, um, a pitch for what we now know as a slide carousel. The pitch takes about three minutes. Now, if Don Draper and his agency were allowed two hours to make their new business pitch, I honestly don't know what they would do with the other hour and 57 minutes. Uh, by comparison to this three minutes, you've got 10. What luxury next week. Um, you should still be able to tell a simple, involving, evocative story in the same way that Don Draper tells this one. And uh, Carly, if it's possible to run the film, I'll I just love the way that he tells that story. Um, you know, he could start off by saying, okay, there are two important rules in advertising, or there's one important rule, but he doesn't. He says, you know, back in my first job, I was in-house at a fur company, worked with this old pro Greek guy, copywriter named Teddy. And he's just building up little levels of detail and, and drawing the audience in. And the impression you get is this guy, Teddy, is like some kind of guru. Um, he might have been David Ogilvy, for all we know, um, but, but he's just setting up this level of expertise that says, you know, the old seasoned pros know this to be true. And it has much more power and much more resonance than, than if you just said, here's a rule about advertising. And, and think about the pictures he uses. You know, they could be, they could be any pictures, but, but he chooses to let people into his family and <coughs> have them be personal pictures, intimate pictures that says, come on into my life. Not just Don Draper, creative director, but Don Draper, sort of husband, father, family man. I'm going to show you pictures of me unshaven and with a cigarette hanging out the side of my mouth and wearing my pajamas and my dressing gown and all the kind of stuff that just you, know, you wouldn't do because, gosh, that's risky and it's unprofessional. I'll, I'll take personal over unprofessional any time. Um, it's personal and unprofessional. It works well. Um, it, that works on so many, so many levels. And it also provides proof. Proof is a really important part of a presentation, and it, and it doesn't require extensive data in order to make your point. I think Don Draper proves his point in that presentation without showing as much as a figure, without showing as much as a graph or a piece of data. Now, here's a slide I showed in a, a global pitch to a very well-known telecommunications company. And I, with, with this particular telecommunications company, we've been having an argument about whether their strategy should be one of acquisition or retention. And they took the view that they had always been a company of acquisition, it was part of their culture, and it, that mattered much more than retention. I believed otherwise, and I'd argued with them a lot and hadn't got anywhere. And when it came to the pitch, I put up this slide and I said, does anybody know what that number represents? And people looked at each other and scratched their heads and said, no, they didn't know. And I said, OK, I will tell you. From your data that you lent to us and that our expert friends at Millwood Brown have been working, we have estimated that 63 million is the number of people worldwide who used to be customers of your company but are now customers of one of your competitors. And I paused and there were a few sharp intakes of breath. And then I said, okay, does any, can somebody just tell me your average revenue per customer? And like a flash, somebody said, 19 euros a month. And I got out my little, well, it was a little Nokia phone at the time, and I started, I got onto the calculator thing, and I said, okay, just bear with me for a second. And I said, 63 million times 19 euros times 12 to give me an annual figure. What does that give us? Oh, and I, I passed it to the client who had been most vociferous on the acquisition issue. And my little Nokia phone said this. 
<laughs> and I, I honestly, the night before the pitch, I could not believe my luck when I did that calculation on my phone and that phrase came up because somehow result too large to display seems much bigger and more ridiculous than the actual number. The actual number was 14 billion euros, which the chief executive agreed you know, quite um, without as much of a, in, you know, a, a pause would be quite nice on his bottom line. We then went on to talk about a retention strategy for that particular company. Um, there should always be numbers in a presentation to provide some kind of solid foundation for what you're doing, but be selective. Don't show all the numbers. You know, I could have shown a hundred slides with all the calculations of that. I only needed to show two. Just one that set up the number of customers and that just set them up for the final punchline of result too large to display. Um, the asshole chart that I showed in the Porsche pitch was, you know, was research, but was proof at the same time. Um, proof that what we were proposing to them about making the company more likable and more approachable and less like an ar arrogant Teutonic German sports car company was the right thing to do. Um, but numbers and smart thinking should be the foundation for everything we do, and don't shy away from them, but keep them as simple as possible. Now, I, I want to say a few words about how to make a presentation, and I, I feel on rather shaky ground saying that, given that I'm doing it from several thousand miles away, and you know, I'm a little corner on a screen and I'm sitting down, which I hate to do when I present, because I think a lot of the energy of presentation comes from the way you use the space in a room and the way you move. Um, but unfortunately, I can't fit on the camera if I stand up. Um, but when, when asked to make a presentation, the default reaction most people have in companies to, is to hit the PowerPoint or keynote icon and start creating slides. And they do it because that's what we all do. It's because what people in business do, and it's the professional thing to do, right? And it's so versatile. You can project it on the wall and you can send it ahead and you can leave it behind. But the reason people do it is because they, they tend to follow an efficiency mindset rather than an effectiveness mindset. And I'll make three quick points about it. First of all, you actually don't need to use slides at all. Um, a lot of the best presentations in history have been made without slides. Um, you know, I believe the Gettysburg Address didn't have a single visual in it. Um, Martin Luther King didn't use them for his I Have a Dream um, speech. Um, Churchill didn't use them for, for the Fight Them on the Beaches speech. They were very good and very persuasive presentations without the need for visual aids. You do not need them. Sometimes just standing there and talking is all you need. Um, I don't think if, if you do decide to use slides, you should never write a presentation in slides. Um, I, I usually write my presentations using post-it notes. Uh, where every point that I think I want to make goes onto a separate post-it note and I just put them out on a wall or on a table and then once I've got all the points and all the pieces of evidence that I want to use, start sorting out the order in which I'm going to show them. Um, because that way I can see the entire presentation in one go as, as opposed to slide by slide. Um, I also think it's important to avoid templates. There are, there are several things that I hate in this world um, paradigm shift is one of them, you know, those little inverted comma things are another. Templates in presentations is another. A presentation to the Coca-Cola company by Ogilvy and Mather, you know, in some weird template around every slide. They know they work for the Coca-Cola company. They know they've walked into Ogilvy's office. They don't need to be reminded. And, and I want all of the attention to be focused on whatever I'm projecting on the wall. I do not want it to be focused on the peripheral crap that's written in different typefaces and that just gets in the way. Um, if Martin Luther King didn't need them, nor do we. Now, you know, I suppose it's possible that when Martin Luther King did stand before the Lincoln Memorial that day, it might have been better if he'd have had access to the kind of PowerPoint technology that we have today and all those wonderful little tricks. Um, but I don't think so. When you present, the most important thing to remember, and the, re the, way, the, the reason most people go wrong when they're preparing their visuals for a presentation, is that they forget 
that the presentation is about the presenter, not what's being projected on the wall. What's being projected on the wall is there to help the presenter make their point. It's meant to punctuate the presentation. It's meant to provide headlines. It's meant to provide reminders of the important things, occasionally to intrigue, occasionally to, to pose questions. But generally, attention should be focused on the presenter. If you put up a slide like this, attention will not be on the presenter. Everybody in the room will be looking at different parts of it at different times. And I, I think I've been fairly generous with this one as an example, um, because I've seen many slides in presentations that include far more words than this, far more detail. And I, I generally prefer not to have more than about seven words on a slide. Um, you should apply the 50 mile an hour rule to any slide. Uh, which is the same rule that, that good art directors apply to um, billboards, which is if you pass them at 50 miles an hour, you need to be able to get it. And I defy anybody to pass that at 50 miles an hour and be able to get it. Um, remember the meaning of visual aids. Um, visual aids, they are visuals that are there to aid your presentation to help you in making your points. Um, when Churchill report, reported to the British House of Commons on the Dunkirk evacuations, it was a, a rallying cry to the British people not to give up hope, to stand and fight the Nazi invasion if and when it happened, and also to appeal to the United States to come and enter the war on the Allied side. Um, Churchill talked long and lyrically about fighting in the hills and fighting on the beaches and, and in the streets and, and in the towns and in, and in the hills and never surrendering. But that prosaic stuff, yeah, it's inefficient. Probably could have been a lot better if he'd have just done what professional presenters do and provided some piece of art that shows the arresting of progress, a snappy headline, stop the Nazis, and then a list of places where Nazi progress might be arrested. Um, a much more efficient PowerPoint professional way of making the presentation. I don't think so. If Churchill had wanted to use visual aids, I suppose he could have done worse than putting up a headline that, that provides a reminder as he's waxing lyrical about fighting on the beaches and in the streets and in the towns and in the hills and never surrendering, that reminds people that we're talking about the defense of the island. Sometimes a visual with that's helpful, you know, this is an evocation of the island that we're defending. Here maybe more powerfully are the people most vulnerable who we need to defend. Those are the kind of visuals that work better than stuff that's got a lot of detail on it. I would rather see 20 separate slides, each of which, which makes one point very succinctly than one point that has 20, uh, one slide that has 20 points all crammed onto the same one, because those 20 points will have no impact whatsoever and um, better one at a time and longer. I once had somebody work for me who I asked, to, I asked him to simplify a presentation and he came back and he said, I've done it. And I said, well, okay, so what have you done? He said, well, I presented you with 50 slides before and I've now got it down to 25. And I looked at the 25 and realized all he'd done was take the information from each of the 50 slides and just sort of compress the same information down so there was twice as much on each slide. I said, no, that's not the point. I would rather you presented me with 200 and just went through them really quickly because that would actually provide an energy to your presentation. But instead, you've made them completely incomprehensible. Um, the next slide I'm going to show you is, is possibly one of the most effective presentation slides you could ever use. It used to be used a lot in the days of slide carousels. You see it used less today in Keynote and PowerPoint, but, but I think very good. And, and this is that slide. It's a blank slide. It's a slide that allows you to walk in front of the screen and say, OK, I've talked about a lot of things, but if there's one thing I want you to remember, one thing above all, it's this. And you can talk about it with all attention focused entirely on you. And when you make your presentations on Monday, the client will be buying you. It will be buying the members of your team. And it will be buying you because it, the client has to trust what you're saying. Has, the client has to believe in what you're saying and believe that what you're proposing represents a better future for them and for the cause that, that they represent. Um, so, so take any opportunity you have to, to focus that 
that audience attention on the individual presenters as and when they're presenting. Now, if I've got time, um, I would like to just make one last point, and this, this has to do with another bugbear of mine, and it's about writing, and it's about the kind of language um, that is used in presentation. This is David Ogilvy. David wrote a memo to his agency um, with 10 points on it, um, based on the idea that people who write well think well. And I think you can make exactly the same points about presentation, and I see this abused almost every day of my working life. And, and what I'm talking about here is people thinking that because they're making a business presentation, they have to behave in a certain way and they have to speak in a certain way to enhance their credentials as marketing people or advertising people or business people. And this, that if they don't use the language that advertising and marketing and business people use, then they won't be taken seriously. Ogilvy's view on this was that you should write the way you talk. I would say that you should present the way you talk in normal conversation as well, and that is to do so naturally. Uh, this is my dog. Um, this is Freddie. And on any given day, I could take Freddie out to my, my car, and I could say to him, Freddie, hopefully we can have a commitment to a scenario in terms of the vehicle which will have you positioned according to best practice within a reasonable time frame. Now, I don't think Freddie would understand that any more than I understand it. What Freddie does understand is, Freddie, get in the car. Presentations should adopt the Freddie get in the car philosophy as opposed to the commitment to a scenario in terms of... Ogilvy also said to his people, you should use short words, short sentences, short paragraphs. Not to dumb it down, um, but because it allows you to make difficult, interesting points more simply and more memorably. Never use jargon words. They are the hallmark of a pretentious ass. Um, only David Ogilvy could, could use that phrase, and I think it's wonderful. Is a lovely Western Australian view, and it reminds me of a very well-known piece of writing. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Short words, short sentences, very simple and to the point. Um, if a marketing person had been writing that particular, particular sentence, they may have said, and God said, let's shift this light paradigm. And God said, the key deliverable is light. And it was... God reached out to his key stakeholders and leveraged their petty competencies. God's strategic imperative was for there to be an enhanced illumination scenario, and the desired out was achieved. You can return me to full picture now, if that's possible, um, because those are the end of my slides. Please use normal language when you present next week. Please be real people. Please have a conversation with your audience. I think the conversation is always, always more effective than a presentation. That's all I had to present. Uh, I'm very happy to take questions if there's time. And if indeed there's anybody there. This is a weird experience <laughs> making a presentation. They, they all, they all it's completely invisible. <laughs> Now that was that was good was round of applause. Yeah. 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 Oh, you gone? Can you, can you still hear us? I'm still yes, I'm still here, and I can still hear you. Can you still hear? All, all I would say is if that's if that's what you can do when you're jet lagged and your brain is somewhere over the Pacific and you've flown for 36 hours. God help us um, if you were uh, actually, you know, on the same time base and the same continent and uh, fully, fully fit. That was fantastic. Um, now, we've got time for a few questions. Um, the, the question sort of uh, rigmarole is quite difficult because um, what you have to do is turn, is stand up, turn round, get a microphone, address the camera at the back of the um, auditorium, which is sort of the one next to the light on the right. Not the two, not the two at the back. 
Yes. <laughs> by the, yeah, the camera, but by the speaker. The speaker. And, um, and ask John the question. He will, you won't be able to see him as you speak, but he will be able to see you. It's kind of weird, but I think it'll work. So, do we have any questions? Yes, Polly. Who got a mic? Stand up, face back. Face, yeah, face the camera. Can you, I can see you. Yeah. <laughs> John, John, can you hear us without the mics? Yes. Hello, John. Um, I want to ask, where do you stand on pitch theatre or pitch cheese, that sort of thing, you know, dressing up in T-shirts, saying, choose us and all of that kind of thing? Mm. I, I, I'm all into, I'm all in favour of pitch theatre when it's relevant. Um, you know, I've I've seen pitches where clients are greeted by Peruvian um, pipe bands, and and walk into a conference room that's got sand all over the floor and deck chairs in it, and I think that's strange. That's a toilet. They're a toilet paper company. You know, what is the relevance of that? Um, I I think anything that, that just, anything that shows enthusiasm in a relevant way is great. Um, what, you know, what, one of the things I'd meant to mention earlier but didn't is when I, when I made that point about involving the whole agency in, in a pitch, my, when, when I run a pitch, I usually try to have the, new, have the, the leave behind document be something that it, it's, it's got a one page summary of the presentation, a one page prose summary that's beautifully written and that summarises all of the important points and, and if somebody's not there you can give it to them they will understand absolutely everything about what you were presenting. And the rest of the document is devoted to introducing everybody from the agency through the lens of the pitch idea. So for example a pitch that we made to Nikon where the idea was the best pictures aren't necessarily those that are technically the best, they're the ones that mean the most. So we set up this scenario of there's a bushfire police are at the door, you've got five minutes to get out of your house, um, what are you going to save? And our research had shown us that what people would save is pictures, and we said to people in the agency, if you could only save one picture, which would it be? And you know, we'd then have Alison Bentley, who was the um, assistant to the president, introducing herself via this beautiful picture of her mother taken on her wedding day, and a little paragraph about why it went and why, why it meant so much to her. Somebody else with a picture of his best friend who sadly passed away a year before and how much that meant and how the expression just captured everything about their relationship and, and and I got into considerable trouble because I put a picture of a mountain gorilla in the book and talked about why that meant a lot to me. My wife saw the book afterwards and she saw everybody else had written these sort of paragraphs of love to their partners and I'd written about mountain gorilla. Um, but but there, there was a... There was a uh, long story. Anyway, I'm still married after 25 years, so somehow. But um, but it, it was all about engaging everybody in the agency, and I suppose showing the agency's enthusiasm for the idea. You know, and, and that's enthusiasm that's real and and deep, as opposed to something that's superficial with a silly line on a t-shirt. Sorry, long answer to, to a short question. No, good good answer, thank you. Next question. Question. Yes, Joe. Stand up, turn around, get your mic. Thank you. I can't hear it. Hi, John. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've had we've had feedback over the years off of clients that we've pitched to, um, which on the one hand has said uh, you asked for work and we thought that was desperate, and then other feedback which has gone you didn't ask for the work, we didn't think you wanted it. Um, where do you stand on asking for the work at the end of the pitch? Yeah, it's like I said earlier, clients smell desperation like dogs smell fear. And I, I think you've got to find a way of saying it without saying it. Um, and again, it comes back to Jeremy's point about complicit audience. Everything you do in that pitch, everything you do in that 10 minutes, everything in what you leave behind at the end, has to suggest to the client that you want that business more than any of the other groups want it, that you believe in what you say more than any of the other groups believe in what they're saying. And you know, it's more about actions speaking louder than words. Um, 
for, for me, running a pitch, everything I do is geared towards creating that reaction. And sometimes it's possible to do it via indirect means. I know at Goodby we used to show a video at the end that was entitled 10 Reasons Why You Should Hire Us. And nine of them were usually fairly silly reasons, like we'd pitch against an agency in Minneapolis quite a lot. And we'd always, we, we shot this video in Finland one time, knowing that this would be very useful for us, of a guy up to his thighs in snow in a parka, and just, we, you know, just making the points about plane delays and how difficult it is to get to meetings if you hire an agency in Minneapolis. You know, we used to use the fact of you know, having more good restaurants in San Francisco than any other city in the planet you know, as a selling point. A lot of them were just ridiculous things. You know, but, but at the end, there would be a slide that just said, you know, we want it more. Um, you know, and we're, you know, we're like, we've got the people and we're ready to go, we're ready to start work on Monday. Um, but at the same time, we used to make demands of clients. At one point in our pitch, we would always say, we'd like to tell you what we think is important for you as a client. If you want to get the best work out of this agency, this is what we ask of you as a client. And we want to ask that of you now and see where you sit on it because we honestly can't promise we can do our best work if you're not able to promise that you can do these things. And that's another example of being an equal in this process and say it's a two-way thing. Too many agencies are too desperate for the business. They'll do anything to win business that is wholly unsuited to that agency um, and that will make people in the agency miserable if they win it. And it's good business not to get involved with people like that. Very good. One more question, perhaps. No? Oh, yes. Gal. Um, you talked about some great examples. What's the... Stand up, Gal. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, John. Can you say anything? Um, you talked about some great examples, some great pitch-winning ideas and theatre and strategies. What's the worst example you've been involved in? <laughs> Um, gosh, well, the, one of the most embarrassing ideas I've ever seen presented, we actually won the pitch in the end, but it was when I was at BMP, we pitched the Fusters Lager business, and the Courage people running the pitch very much wanted to hire BMP to, to work on that brand, because we worked on all the other Courage brands, but we, we made an absolutely appalling pitch which culminated in the then creative director, Alan Tilby, introducing this idea that had the tagline, there's a whole lot of Aussie in a fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> and you, when he presented it, you, you could literally see the color draining from the, the faces of the clients. And at the end of it, they said, okay, you've got one week to come back with a better presentation than that. <laughs> and we went away, unfortunately. Unfortunately, did that. The, actually, the the worst pitches I've ever seen. I, I've been lucky enough to sit on the client side for a couple of pitches, and when I was working in London, I was once asked by our client at Ford to help them choose a research agency, and I went out to Dagenham to see five pitches, a number of which were made by WPP companies. I'm embarrassed to say, um, the first four of them were absolutely identical. And you, you wouldn't believe, each one of them, five people showed up, five people who were dressed identically, who would spend the first couple of minutes scrabbling around and trying to connect their computers, and up would come the thing that said no media found, and there'd be lots of head scratching and muttered swearing, and, and then finally the chief executive was, oh, okay, all right, we're ready to go, and, and they'd say, you know, oh, hello, I'm the chief executive, and, you know, our agency is very excited by the opportunity to work with you, and... We're going to show you how our offering is unique and how different we are to everybody else and you know how generally brilliant we are. And then they'd say, oh, well, I'm going to hand over to Tracy and Tracy's going to talk about this. And Tracy would go, thank you, Derek. And Tracy would talk about something and then hand over to Alison. And Alison would go, thank you, Tracy. And he'd hand over slide after slide, dense number packed slide after slide. And... I think about halfway through the second presentation, I'd lost the will to live. And it was remarkable just how convinced each of these agencies were with how different they were from each other and how absolutely identical they all were and how absolutely useless they all were. The fifth agency, one guy walked into the room and 
he started to move towards the computer hookup and then said, actually, do you mind if we just have a conversation? And we looked at him, hopefully, and said, actually, yes, that would be fine. And, and he sat down and he said, yeah, I, he said it's, it's absolute, <clears throat> it's a great honor to be asked. And he said, my company's new, as you know, it's a great honor to be asked. But he said, I don't think I've got the capability in my company to be able to do what you're asking for. He said, I think the other companies who I know have presented to you are probably much better suited to handle your needs than I, than I am. But he said, I love the car business. Um, I've worked on it for a number of years. I've been thinking about, you know, since I was asked to do this, I've thought of nothing else. And I've just got a few ideas I wouldn't mind sharing if you just want to have a chat. And we said, yeah, yeah, let's have a chat. I think within that first couple of minutes, he'd won the business. And we then had a conversation. He'd got lots of really interesting ideas about their business, about their strategy, about the way research could help identify new opportunities, overcome problems. And at the end, we said, yeah, it's clear to us that you don't have the capability to do a lot of the things that the other companies can. But we want to work with you. We want you to be our strategic partner. And if we need to use some of those agencies to supply individual expertise, um, you know, call center capability or whatever it is, we'll use them. But that's all we're going to use them for. We're going to use you as somebody who understands how to apply research to the car business. And... And we made that decision because he kept it simple and he made it relevant and he made it personal and it was, it was intimate and he didn't blind us with slides like all the others did. Those others were awful. And I've always remembered that since. that I, I have to, You cannot assume that just because you as an agency think you're different that the client will think you're different too because to most clients, most agencies are similar. That's the chief executive stands up, then the planning director and then the creative director and um, then, you know, a few, you know, things from the, the media guy who's last on and um, and yet you are very similar and you've, you've got to find something and this is the last thing I'll say. You've got to put something in your presentation that that client will remember next Monday because as they're thinking about all the presentations, they have to go, you know, that presentation where the guy showed the asshole chart, you know, that thing that about the asshole factor, that's the memorable moment. And there's got to be a memorable moment. As John, John Shaw, my, one of my planning colleagues, describes it as the fuck me moment, when it's like suddenly everything is apparent, that, like the 63 million number too large to display. That's the moment that somebody will remember. And you've got to have one of those somewhere in those 10 slides if that's what you're showing next Monday. Brilliant. John, thank you very much.